and welcome to Overtime Hockey Talk. My name is Mark Paul and my co-host Justin Baker in the studio as we dive into all things second round of the National Hockey League playoffs and we'll also go over all of the award nominations from the heart to the selkie to the to the pussy bing to <laughs> the masterton Norris Vesna, you know, all those things. You had to throw that in there, didn't you? Throw what in there? I, I heard that. That was her name. Okay. I, I, I'm... Oh, Lady. Oh, lady. I, I, Bing. Sorry, I read that wrong. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's first off uh, pick a series. Let's start there. Which one do you start with? Should we start with the... Carolina. Carolina series, yeah. where the only team that has managed to win back-to-back games here in the second round. The Hurricanes look fine. Uh, I would say that it has certainly been a... Well, now there's two goaltenders coming in. Two, yeah. Uh, it has been the story of the goaltenders in this series so far. Uh, not very many goals. And I think six goals. Six goals for the yeah. first two games. So. One goal in the first game and three oh, in sorry, this. Sorry, four goals, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was Nothing. thinking both. Yeah, so uh, Carolina winning almost... Uh, Almost one of those series where you look at it and you go, like, in reality, the Islanders could have won game one and two. They could be up to nothing. Uh, Carolina getting fortunate, getting goals at the right time. Uh, obviously, they had the only goal. Uh, what's your, is is it that, I mean, Robin Leonard's not playing bad. No, not at played all. Played very well. Uh, is there something the Islanders need to do now to to attempt to score some goals? Because that's, that was what we thought their problem would be in round one. Could they score enough goals to outpace the Penguins? The answer was absolutely freaking lutely This time, it's, I mean, can they score any goals on this Carolina team? <laughs> they, they look slow against Carolina. But although they're, they are getting their opportunities, it's not like they're not getting shots on goals. So. No, they're, they're getting plenty of opportunities. I, I think you got to tip your cap first off to Curtis McElhaney coming in off the bench, right? Mrazek gets hurt. and 17 saves, I think. Yeah, he looked good. I, I mean, he got tested early, too, and I figured if, you know, and of course, you know, they're, they're going to complain still about the one kicked in goal from behind the net. Um, and for those who didn't really see it, basically, I can't remember who it was. He took a shot. McElhaney made the save. It came, the rebound came out behind the line, behind the net, and he, like, he tried to kick it in front of the net, and then he ended up kicking it, and it bounced off McElhaney's pad and went in backwards behind him, and uh, first time I've ever seen a kicked in goal from behind the line. Behind the net, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so interesting. But I, and more than anything else, I just think, I, I honestly don't think that the Islanders really need to change up too much right now. I think, uh, obviously, like you said, speed would be great, but given who they have on that team, that roster, they're not going to find much more speed at this point in the juncture. I think maybe if you're Barry Trotz, you might consider trying to get you know, um, Barzell some more minutes if, where you can. I mean, I mean at, at, at very least, it's encouraging to see Barzell score his first goal to play. Yes. Even though yeah. technically he didn't even put the puck in the net. It went off somebody else. So, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're still, you're, you're getting the goal. And, uh, you know, I, back to the, uh, to the kick in, please. I, I, this is a total sidebar, but the league wants to increase goal scoring all the time. Why are we not allowing goals that get kicked in? That's interesting. At, at this point in the game, I, I it's kind of like soccer with handballs, right? Like they don't allow handballs because that's just, you know, it yeah, almost but, seems like a cheater's way. But, but that's the whole. Po- but the whole point is that, you know, yeah, you can't use your hands because if the ball's in the air, if that completely changes the game, if you can score it with your hand, it's supposed to be scored with with the feet, with the feet, just like it's supposed to be scored with the stick. But oh, I will say this though, a- you can get goals off. Parts of your body, right? right? Like Pavelski got one off his face oh, yeah, early can, in round yeah, one. And you can get goals. Off, you know, obviously you can score goals off your head in soccer, right? And so, to me, that's what it is. It's it's a he- it's a header goal. Like if the puck is sitting down below and and your stick is tied up, why shouldn't you be able to give it a little kick? I mean, I understand. Even thirty years ago, maybe you, you don't you don't feel like you have the proper equipment to where if a guy kicks and and uh you know catches somebody with the blade they're gonna right. cut or something but i just feel like we're to the point where i mean i know though who is the guy who on uh, the florida panthers what he he fell oh. backwards and, and just cut the guy's jugular uh, open dvorak was it dvorak <sighs> yeah uh, one of those guys but i mean that's a 
that had nothing to do with trying to kick the puck. Right. So it's not like we Hip see check. this. I think Sean Burke had his finger cut off one time. Like Ooh. his glove fell off and his finger got got sliced. Yeah, I've seen some brutal some brutal skate cuts. But I, I don't think that allowing kicked goals is going to all of a sudden increase the amount of fingers lost via goaltender. I'm I, not opposed to the thought, but right now, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I've never really given it too much thought other than that's the rule, so... Too bad. I remember watching Brett Hull lost his stick at the circle and kicked it and scored. <laughs> kicked it like a soccer ball and he scored. The circle. Didn't allow it, obviously, but I mean, that's... Any, anyways, okay, so... If you can kick it fast enough where the goalie's not paying attention and it... Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, should have, that should count basically cool. through that dumb butt. Uh, Warren Fogle scoring again for Carolina. He's been, I think, their unsung hero of the first and second round here so far for scoring his five goals in, in their nine games. And uh, yeah, I mean it up to nothing. You have to think Carolina is going to win this series. You know, they're going to find a way to win one going game back at home, home. I think, yeah. You know, well, they, and they've, if there's, if there's a, a team that has advantage at home at this point, uh, I think Carolina it's in a big way, but also, you know, I thought about this last night. I was hanging out with somebody and they said, Oh, you know what? It's it's weird how the Islanders. I think they've been switching between arenas, right, during the season. And I said, yeah, they they have been. And it dawned on me. Yeah, they played the first round in Nassau, and the, now they're playing all the rest of the games in Barclay. And what do you know? They just lost both games in Barclay. Well, dude, every every NHL person I've listened to on radio or read online, they say there's just a different atmosphere at the Coliseum than there is at uh, at Barclays, and. I, I kind of agree. I mean, I, I watch games and fans at the Coliseum are just, they're louder, they're more energetic, they're more pumped up, right? And it does, I mean, I don't think it's a huge effect, but I do think it does play a, a little bit into, you know, into the games. I, 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 well, it seems to be like Nassau's the like, oh, it's the rink in my backyard. I'll walk over there. And like, you know, right. it's, it's in my, my place. But then Barclays is like, oh, I have to, I have to take a, a subway and all these things like I have to, it takes a lot longer to get there. I'll right. Say. So, but anyways, interesting that they lost their first two games there and, uh, and won both games when it was Nassau. So I don't know if there's anything to it, but Carolina up to nothing, San Jose and Colorado game one was, uh, was really, I'd say all, all San Jose. Uh, they looked really good. Colorado, though, in game two, managing to, uh, you know, to come back. They were down and they hold off the Sharks. They hold off the Brent Burns attack. He scored two goals. Granted, one of them was with 11 seconds left. But uh, your thoughts on this series so far? Tied 1-1. It's been pretty even. I think I think you and I both pegged this series to go deep. I think we uh, both said seven. Yeah. And did one of us say? Did you say Colorado? I did not. No, no I you said, said San, San Jose. Jose. I yeah. think I said San Jose too, but I can't remember. I think you said Colorado. Uh, maybe I said Colorado. I, think you did. I actually, I uh, I was tweeting with the Colorado Twitter. Oh, really? Because I they actually did this really cool thing. You can go on. Uh, I think it's at Avalanche, and they at the beginning of the second round they said, "Welcome bandwagon Avalanche fans." You know. <laughs> We just want to let you know what's been going on in the season up to this point. And there was just a thread of tweets where it had like we started the season hot and we went cold and then all these things happened and like we traded for this guy and they basically recapped the whole season and then gave little blurbs about all their best players. Actually, not even just their best players, pretty much all their players. And it was just a really cool way to just say, hey, you know, maybe that maybe this is the first time you've paid attention to avalanche hockey this year let's give you a little recap and it was nice they're engaging it was good marketing it It, it was really good marketing but it was i i had tweeted at them i was like i want to cheer for them but i want joe thornton to lift a cup and i think their response was well well (laughs) so that's pretty good i i think that this is still going to go the Sharks' way when all is said and done. Although the Avalanche have shown that they can adjust very well, they lost Game One to Calgary and then they went on a went on a torrent pace, That's won true. four of the next five. So yeah, I will say Martin Jones looked pretty good last game. I mean, granted four goals, but he still looked pretty good. So I can't point the finger his way, at least right now for this series. 
which is nice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'd say actually on the flip side, Grubauer has looked less... Th- he looks normal. Right. That's so, a good word. And I think that that's probably the Sharks' best hope is if Grubauer <laughs> looks normal. That's that's always what you want to see when the opposing goaltender looks normal. So that's uh, game one and two. Let's go to the Blues and the Stars are on tonight. Uh, we're recording this at about 5 o'clock on Monday. Uh, so the Stars and the Blues play tonight, and this series has been maybe one of the more... I don't I don't know if I thought this would be a really exciting series when it when it started. But to me that that game 1 and 2, they maybe were the some of the best games of this second round so far. Uh you're getting some goals, you're getting a lot of saves, both goalies playing pretty well. Uh of course we talked about in the beginning Bennington and Bishop are both some of the best goaltenders in the league this season and going head to head it's tied 1-1. Uh, the Stars' power play looks like it's what they're going to need to maybe carry them through to be able to to win this series. Now that we're tied 1-1, do you have uh, any new opinions about where you think this is going? No, I still still like St. Louis. Um, although I will say Dallas does have me a little bit more worried right now seeing they can score goals. But on the flip side, I will say Bingington, right? He's He's the one guy... No experience in the playoffs. I will say for all his years in the AHL, it's kind of prepped him for this moment because he's. I, I this last game he showed some some adversity where he's just like, oh man, he probably shouldn't have gave up that goal, or you know, he just he doesn't look like the Bingington that we're used to, right? And he he respond responded very well, made some some key saves, and so I don't worry so much that you know he's starting to fall apart or that he's going to at any point. I think for Stars fans, that's that's encouraging that he he can bounce back and looks like he will do just fine. Well, it's uh, actually discouraging to Stars fans. It very much is. But I will say... <laughs> encouraging to Blues fans. Uh, on right? the flip side for Dallas, I've noticed that when Tarasenko is not as engaged and not producing, Stars can't win. The Blues. Yeah, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Blues can't win. <laughs> and, I mean, you saw it last game. They, they shut Tarasenko down and... Uh, kept him off the score sheet, and I think if Dallas wants to win the series, that's what they got to continue to do. Yes, but you know what? At the same time, St. Louis has been able to shut down that top line for the Stars. They have two points through these first two games, which, you know, if we get to a, a game seven and that line has six points through six games, uh, something's gone terribly wrong with that top line. So, right. <laughs> uh, to me, I, I think I I picked Dallas in the beginning, and I'm sticking with them because I think if that line can get it going, that should be the difference between these two teams. I think these two teams are actually quite similar. Uh, they they both have high end defensemen. They both have uh, you know about the equivalent of one really good line. St. Louis kind of switches guys up a little bit, but St. Louis maybe has more depth throughout. You know, all the way down to their fourth line, but I just I think I like the the Stars' top line significantly better than I like the Blues. Oh, I won't disagree with that at all. But I to to your point with the depth, right? If if St. Louis wants to win and they continue to shut down, if both teams you know lock out each other's top lines, then you got to give the nod to St. Louis still just because of that depth. I would agree with that. Okay, let's go back to the Eastern Conference. Close this baby out. The Bruins and the Blue Jackets. I don't think that there's been uh, very many non-Bruins fans that are cheering for the Bruins in this series. No. I, <laughs> no, don't. Uh, yeah, I, it's funny because oftentimes these teams, you know, people are sick of, of Boston, I think. I think people are sick of the Patriots and they're sick of the the Red Sox like they're sick of Boston <laughs> and because if you think about it really the Bruins well they have been they've been uh, good like the last ten years eight years they've been good uh, but they they had a couple years where they were definitely slump like slumping down and it looked like things were not going to go their way they missed the playoffs in one year and this is a team that they I mean they went to the Stanley Cup Finals they went to the Conference Finals. I think once or twice during that span as well, but they, it's not like they've seen phenomenal success all throughout and that they, you know, they're making the the finals a couple times. It's funny that so many people tend to just 
Nah, anybody but the Bruins. Come on, anybody but the Bruins. Even though the Bruins haven't had that much success, they really haven't been there that often in comparison to some of these teams. I think maybe it's coming from people's desire as they look at the playoff tree and they see the rest of these teams and they go, and most of these teams haven't been there. Right. So, Every other team hasn't really had much success the last few years. San Minus Jose. San Jose. But, um, you know, I think there's some but likable like factor. Yes. Yeah. People like San Jose. I don't Yeah. Boston just. I don't know. Brad Marchand and Chara, they make it easy for you to hate that team, you know, just to point the finger and be like, I don't really like like that guy. I think he's a scumbag or something like that. And and then to your point, too, I do think it kind of, you know, Boston has had a lot of success sport wise. So let some other city have it. Yeah, and that's that's fair, I guess. I I, I mean, I just don't like them because they always beat my well, team. Well, I don't like Marchand, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, they haven't been able to shut down Panarin. That's, uh, that's been clear. Two points through the first two games. Uh, but both games going to overtime. Just really just coin flip here. It's a tight series. Are you sticking with... Columbus? Columbus. I am. Bob Roski looks great. I think that was actually our, our only pick that was the same. It right? was. Because I think I picked Colorado and I picked Carolina. You did. And I picked... I'm uh, getting worried for my Islanders pick. I but, picked Dallas. but Yeah. yeah. I, Columbus, I look, you and I, we, we know this has been a tight couple games. And um, Bob Roski to me has just been the, the X factor, I think. He's been, he's been giving Columbus the edge to stay in these games and he just looks phenomenal and if he just keeps it up i mean rask isn't playing bad by enemies he's playing good hockey but i think Bobrovsky's just been better and uh you know if columbus wants to continue rolling they just need him to be better yeah nice 930 save percentage through the first round but, can't hate it but i mean rask 927 so through or through this this point in the playoffs so <clears throat> yes we will uh yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to say a lot of bad about the beginnings of these series because they've been so even. I mean, all right, three two three two or like a four two four two. You know, it's a lot of these games have been very even. Even the Carolina Islander series, both one goal games. It's it's hard to really say one way or another who was necessarily the absolute better team. So we will just keep on watching, and uh, let's let's though move on to. The awards. The awards. As the nominations have come out, something for the rest of the other 23 teams throughout the National Hockey League. Of course, some of these guys are playoff playoff guys, but uh, I really want to start with the Selkie Trophy. Uh, not because it's the first in the corner <laughs> of, the, of the screen <laughs> here, but because, because I think it's interesting that... Uh, where Mark Stone has now found his way onto this list. And I'm one okay, we Selkie Trophy, Patrice Bergeron, Ryan O'Reilly and Mark Stone. We've seen Bergeron and O'Reilly both up for this award before. Mark Stone is a new candidate for it. And I'm wondering is Mark Stone just getting this attention now because he was under such a microscope this year in Ottawa and about being traded and then he gets dealt to Vegas. And he has a a nice run down the stretch. Is that really what put him over the top from uh, maybe some other guys that could have gotten onto this list? Um, I don't know. I think I think honestly, you know, a lot of a lot of voters have a hard time putting a winger on this ballot just because one, you know, the centerman has been known to be the guy that's supposed to be that defensive player on that line, right? When you look at the forward groups, the winger is supposed to hit the boards and. Uh, you know, just shoot the puck, whereas the center has to win those draws, you know, back check and do everything defensively that, you know, maybe wingers usually don't. And so uh, it's easy for writers and guys to just put in a center's name. And, you know, we've seen it plenty of times before. Bergeron, Kopitar, Taves, Kessler, these Dadzuk, these guys have all been centers. And so to me, though, I, I look at his time in Ottawa, what he was able to do, right? He was on such a horrible team, but yet he was a thief with the puck. He played such a good defensive game that he didn't even, I mean, his plus minus numbers were, were positive. And you look at everybody else on that team and it was, it was pretty piss poor. And then, then he goes to a team that actually has, you know, good defense, good offense in front of him. And he was able to still continue that trend and, you know, even increase that a little bit more. And so um, to me, that just kind of shows just 
how good of a defensive player he really was. And I think that made it hard for writers to really keep a winger off this. And I think, gosh, what was the last guy from um, Yuri, Yuri Lettinen from Yuri, Dallas Yuri was Lettinen. the last winger to win, win it. Well, so. he won it like three times, I think. Yeah, something like that. Won it several times. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with, with that, uh, you know, that a center obviously has more, more responsibilities. Uh, you know, I, I, it's hard to argue with it. I, I really think that the name that I would have liked to see on this list was Sidney Crosby because I thought that he had I mean, and he's up for the heart. So maybe that's why he's not. <laughs> that might be. But he's not going to win the heart. I, I don't think. I, I actually think he should. He was my pick. Uh, he was. With yes, about he 25 was. games to go, I picked him for the heart. Uh, just the way he was carrying his team to the playoffs. And uh, ironically, Sidney Crosby, Nikita Kucherov, and Connor McDavid all won the same amount of playoff games. <laughs> <laughs> that's cruel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that's... <laughs> Uh, to me, Crosby, this sums up for what I thought about Crosby towards the second half of the season. He was a fourth-line grinder who played like a superstar. Just honestly, dude, he he grind out every single shift. Can I and, say that before? that I think he's the, the reason he's such a good player is he's the best grinder ever to play hockey. He, he could be up there with, I mean, <laughs> yeah. No, there's no one else better than him. <laughs> I mean, he's already got to be in the top 20 players to ever play, right? I think that's maybe fair. maybe maybe we can whittle that that down even more. He might be in the top ten. Uh, I don't know if I'm in the yet, top but, ten. Hey, talk to me at the end of his career. Okay, well that's fair. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, he's already won three Stanley Cups, so if you want to put that as uh, one of your markers, then doesn't hurt. Okay, uh, people who's, in Montreal have three Stanley Cups, but or yeah. we're on Montreal. Who is your pick? For the Selkie, uh, for the Selkie, I I want to give it to Mark Stone just because I think Bergeron. I almost feel like people at this point just put him in because it's the name at this point. Not that I don't think he's yeah. deserving, but he played like sixty some games, and to me that uh, kind of yeah. hurts his cause yeah. a little bit. Um, I I just like Stone because again I, I think a winger would be great to have win this, and then just what he was able to do when he was in Ottawa, such a poor team. Um, not that Ryan O'Reilly wasn't on a poor team to start the year, but. Uh, it shows what a difference goaltending makes to a player's ability to look, you know, better defensively. That is true. I think that Ryan O'Reilly deserves this award because of there's something when you're the best defensive forward, like you look at these three guys and you think all three of these guys are leaders in their locker room. Right? Vegas is maybe a little bit different from Mark Stone because you're coming over and you're you're relatively new to the locker well, room. Well, Riley was the same way, right? Came over. He right. said he just kept his mouth shut for a long time until they just kept losing. He's like, screw it. Right. And then right. he and took they over. a new so. coach. And, and that is why he, I think he deserves this award is that he, he went to a new team and he changed the culture of that team. I, I really think that he changed the culture of that locker room. Maybe not by himself, but uh, he, was a, he was a big reason why they turned their season around. That and the fact that Holy crap, how are you the best defensive forward and you're up for the Lady Bing Trophy, which is, I mean, basically who had the least amount of penalty minutes, that's really good. <laughs> right. That's that trophy. Uh, so Alexander Barkov, Sean Monahan, and Ryan O'Reilly. I think it's, if, if there's one snub from the Selkie, it would be Barkov. I think you could probably include him in there. Uh, but, I mean, Ryan O'Reilly, to if you win the Selkie and the Lady Bing in the same year, uh, you're doing something very right. Lady Bing would be proud. Yeah, I mean, you got to think too. Like part of your your defensive responsibilities, right? You got to win faceoffs. You got to steal the puck, right? Those little things usually lead to can lead to penalties quite often, more than none. Right. I mean, as is you know easily as they're calling hooking and slashing penalties all the time now in the regular season. You think he would have got a got a few of those, but I mean, what he he had like. 14 penalty minutes? 12. 12, okay. Uh, 12 penalty Ridiculous. minutes. Ridiculous. Yeah, and, and that's and that too is, you know, it's not, sometimes you see these guys and they have like four penalty minutes. Yeah, but I mean, it's really, it's six penalties is what he took. But it is, it's the fact that you're playing the way you're playing and, and you're doing it in a, such a clean way. Yeah, and being such a good defensive player, that allows you to be on the ice when you're killing penalties too. You're not in the box all the time too. Here's a question for you. Do you think we'll ever see Nazem Kadri up for the Lady Bing? 
Uh, oh, you're a funny guy, Mark. Uh, who gets the Lady Bing to you? I want Barkoff to win it because I just... Okay. Yeah. I'm going Ryan O'Reilly on both of those. I won't hate it. I won't hate Ryan O'Reilly if he walks away with it. Um, the Masterton Trophy, Nick Felino, Robin Leonard, and Joe Thornton. All no discussion. Just now, give it to Leonard. I think there's a reason why Leonard's in the middle of this picture. <laughs> right. He's already there. He already wins it. Uh, yeah, quite a quite a comeback year. Also being up for the freaking Vesna Trophy. Like, oh, you had a hard time last year. Well, you know, probably longer than just a year, but... Oh, and then you come back and you're one of the best goalies in the NHL? Okay. All right. Yeah, you deserve that award. But can he win the Vesna? No, the I question. wouldn't have even put him in my top three, to be quite honest. Um, yeah, how many games did he play? He played 48, I think. Let me just let me just look it up. Cause I just don't think that. Yeah, I mean, because he split so much time. That's the thing. He split. He played, okay, 46 games. And then, what, Thomas Grice, 43 games. When you're not a cle- – I mean, don't get me wrong. I think he is the 1A to Grice's 1B. But when you're not clearly the number one on your team like Pekka Rene or, you know, Braden Holpe are in their squads, right? You you shouldn't be up for this award. I, I think – I mean, a- Frederick Anderson des- is, deserves this award more than Robin Lanner. Oh, I would agree if that was if that was the case for sure. I don't know if I would put Robin Lanner in my – um, I don't think Frederick Anderson should win it over the other two guys. No, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, Anderson, I wouldn't have been upset if, had he, you know, gotten in there, but I would have liked to have seen maybe Darcy Kemper in there instead of Robin Lehner, to be quite honest. What he was able to do in Arizona, yeah, Arizona. was incredible. And he played I think if they, could have, if they could have made the playoffs, I think you would have, you would have seen him yeah, in there. Yeah, that would have been much sweeter. But... Yeah, it's uh, it it is funny to see a couple guys who really both. I mean, Ben Bishop only played forty six games too, but I think maybe that's becoming less and less of a thing, I suppose. But I mean, when you look at you know Frederick Anderson, he played sixty. Bobrovsky, who who d- admittedly didn't have the best season, he's not going to be up for that award. But he played sixty two. Even Vasilevsky played fifty three, and he at least missed because of an a, a long term injury, right? Whereas Ben Bishop was hurt at one point. He was hurt too, yeah. So we can give him that. But Leonard is just splitting the the net. You know, it's not like he was hurt. And so would his numbers have been that good had he played 60 games like everybody else? Yes. And that is, that's what you have to consider. Also, you know, I I do think as far as this, this award is just best goaltender. And. Frankly, I think there was a lot of goalies that had a lot more work, like John Gibson, who obviously wasn't going to be up for this award because his team was so bad. But remember, Anaheim was in the playoffs for a long time because of and John it was Gibson. Because of him. Yeah. So I, I just I think that there were goalies that were maybe more deserving to be in there, but ultimately aren't. And uh, you know, I'd say even even Carey Price, I think, had a he had such a a bounce back year for a team. I mean, they almost made it. They almost made the playoffs. It wasn't until the last second that they missed the playoffs, but he, I mean, he carried that team. 35 wins is a pretty stinking good season nowadays. So, uh, yeah. Uh, who's your ultimate pick? Uh, I, it goes to Vasilevsky. His numbers were great across the board and, um, you know, being on the best team in hockey and just, he was good all year round. There was no, like, there were no slumps in his games. Now, I think if Bishop had played a little bit more and wasn't hurt, he might have been able to come in and steal that one from him. But uh, ultimately, I think Vasilevsky gets it. Yeah, I think Tampa Bay is going to take some hardware home here. Uh, quite a few. Remember that the, the times when people were voting on these awards was before the playoffs started. So people are going, holy crap, this guy's unstoppable. So I think he'll win that one. Uh, the Norris Trophy, another Tampa Bay Lightning player up for for grabs for the Norris Victor Hedman also Mark Giordano and Brent Burns so if if we're sticking with tradition and we're going off of uh, the highest scoring defenseman in the NHL then you know that's uh, certainly one way to evaluate this this trophy I'm hoping though that I, I really do think that Victor Hedman deserves this this award I I know Giordano had a phenomenal year you know, he he really he bounced back. He had second most points in the NHL, seventy or for defensemen at seventy four. But I mean, really, if we if we want to go off of that, then you know Morgan Riley is in the discussion for the Norris. Just have it be Burns, Giordano, and Riley because 
that was the there's your top three scorers. Victor Hedman only fifty four points. He's I, I like that the that people are finally recognizing like okay, just because you don't have a ton of points doesn't mean that you uh, you can't be in this discussion. It'll be interesting to see if Brent Burns really gets this award. Then I'm slapping myself in the face. I think it's Geo's. To be quite honest, you think it's Mark Giordano? Yeah, I, I I I agree with you. I think Hedman is the better all around defenseman. He's you know, but that twenty point differential in points between Hedman and Geo really is just it's it's a little bit harder for voters that want you know want to take that sexy pick from Calgary that had you know second most points in the league. Makes yeah, it, and I think that's why you're gonna. But and, they gave Hedman the award last year. Right, but he did put up a pretty decent amount of points, so it wasn't like he was you know, 20 points behind either. But I do think eventually it wouldn't shock me if five, ten years down the road we do see best defensive defenseman and best offensive defenseman. Or just have a just have like an Art Ross trophy for defensemen. Oh, cool, you were the highest scoring defenseman. Great. All right, now here's sure. the Norris. You could do that. You know, and you don't, I guess. I have guess the Bobby Orr award and then have the Nick Lidstrom award. Something like that. Well, what about the Norris? Uh, Where's he going? You got to make it generational. Just come on. You're gonna rename let's, your let's trophies. Let's update him. Let's we we updated Ted Lindsay a few years ago. Yes, the uh, Ted Lo- the Ted Lindsay Award was. Uh, but I mean, that's for what he did with the NHLPA. What, what was, so. That was the Lester B. Pearson mm-hmm. Award. Yeah. Well, uh, let's go to. We're gonna skip the King Clancy Memorial Trophy because. Truly, I have. I don't know what. Uh, congratulations to Oliver Ekman, Larson, Henrik Lundqvist. Just give it to the king, because Jason it's Zucker king for Clancy. <laughs> doing good things in your neighborhoods. Right. <laughs> uh, and we'll we'll just gloss over the Mark Messier NHL Leadership Award. This is probably the only award that Wayne Simmons will ever be nominated for. Ever. Also, again. how can you nominate a guy for a leadership award when he's on two separate teams? Yeah, this is interesting. What is he doing that? What does he? Yeah, what did he do that was so <laughs> full of leadership? Um, well, but it's a trophy honoring leadership qualities and a role in growth of the game. So. I mean, I'm not okay. I'm not disagreeing that he's not a, a leader because everybody from Philly to Nashville says he's he's a great voice in the locker room, a great leader. So can't knock him there. But it's just to me, if if you're changing teams during the year, I just I don't know for this award, anyways. I don't yeah, know. it's hard. Uh, yeah, especially because the award has so much to do with what you do in your community, and you happen to not be in the community anymore. It's a little, little hard. Not, not his fault, but although you know, maybe if he had taken less money, he could have stayed there. But there you go. Uh, let's go the Jack Adams Award. Uh, Craig Berube, John Cooper, and Barry Trotz. Obviously, John Cooper of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Craig Berube with the St. Louis Blues coming in somewhat like what maybe twenty, twenty eight or. Uh, 20 or 30 games in, something like that. Yeah. And then Barry Trotz with the New York Islanders. Who takes this? Barry award? Trotz. I think so, too. Yeah. I mean, I, just being able to go from the worst defensive team to the best, make the playoffs. I mean. It's a coach. Yeah, it's a coach. 100%. Thing. It's Absolutely. Coaching you lose thing. one guy. You lose arguably a superstar player, and you're going to turn the team around like that. And, of course, it's it's the coach, right? Because, I mean, Thomas Grice, a couple years ago, right? Good numbers. Terrible numbers last year comes back. Good numbers this year. So, what's the difference there? No, I mean it, it's the coach, really. Is the coach? I know there's one award. It's at least the GM of the year award. They vote after the second round. Is it? Yes. I can't remember. I I don't. I I think coach of the year is just the the regular season. It is. I don't think they wait for the for some of the playoffs. But the GM of the year they they do wait until that would the, end of the second sense. round. Because the GM of the year is going to be somebody who's at least in the final four of the end, because that's Did that's how you know deadline that, trades pay yeah. off. You know, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm going Barry Trotz all the way. I don't like John Cooper. Yeah, he had an unbelievable season, but you can give Cooper second place, and I, w- I would think it would be a lot closer than most people are going to think, because to be able to just to be able to continually win all year long is something hard to do and keep your players motivated. So I got to get tip my cap to him for that. I think there'll be a lot of people that vote John Cooper. I think it'll be real close, but all right. Uh, the Calder trophy, Jordan Binnington, Rasmus Dolan and Elias Pedersen. Uh, not on this list. Miro Heiskinen, who is asked about, uh, you know, Hey, how do you feel about this? The Calder snub. And he said, I don't know. I really like playing in the playoffs, though. So, okay. 
Ouch. Yeah, I like the Stanley Cup playoffs. I mean, because that was, you know, is it Dolan or, or Heiskanen? Uh, at the same time, though, of course, Jordan Binnington is playing against him on the other side. So, right. <laughs> so he's also in the playoffs. But yeah, I this this is actually a really cool setup for nominations because it's a rookie goaltender, forward, and a defenseman. Yeah, how often does that happen? I, I don't think very I don't think maybe, of that often. I think maybe the last time was when Tyler Myers won it because Jimmy Howard was nominated. I remember well, that. Well, Aaron Eckblad won. Who was who Aaron Eckblad won the Calder in like what 2014 or 2015 or something like that. So I think he's the last defenseman to win it. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know the last time a goaltender won the Calder. Uh, who is your pick here for this the Calder? Because. I'd really like to see a goalie win. I think it'd be kind of cool. I would love to see Bingington win it, but I think just because it took so long for him to come in during the regular season, had he started the beginning of the year, and even if his numbers had dropped, say, you know, 10 percentage, you know, from 920 something to whatever to 919, he probably would have won it. But sorry. But Elias Pedersen was just so good. Yeah, he was good all year. So fun to watch. He did get hurt a little bit, but. And. Rasmus Dahlin did exactly what we thought he'd do, where, I mean, I'd say by the end of the year, he was significantly better than he was in the beginning. Uh, I just don't think he had the same impact that Bennington or Pedersen had. Like, Elias Pedersen, at the beginning of this year, Vancouver was supposed to be quite bad, and there was minimal hope. And he came in, and very early on, he was magical. And all of a sudden it was, oh, I'm going to watch Vancouver games now. Because <laughs> you just want to, he was a human highlight machine. And I think there's something to be said about the entertainment factor. And he's he certainly is entertaining. So Steve Mason, by the way, last goalie to win. Steve Mason for yes, Columbus Blue Jackets, 08 09. Oh. And then Tyler Myers the next yes, year. Yes, 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 yes. Steve Mason, that was really like his own. Prior to that, uh, Andrew former. Raycraft, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, former Toronto guy. But he was in Boston was at the Boston. time. Boston. Nabokov and then Martin Broder before that. So there you go. All right. Well, our last trophy, the uh, the big one, the I failed to win a playoff game. <laughs> valuable player. Uh, we have Sidney Crosby, Nikita Kucherov, and Connor McDavid. Uh, I do. You, do you think that this award? See, I, even if even if they voted for this like after the f- first round or something like that, I think that. We probably have the same players in there. Uh, Sidney Crosby was the horse of the regular season. Kucherov was just on fire all year long. And Connor McDavid had to carry a really garbage team. That's so true. He also set career highs in points, too, which was nice. Yes, he did. Uh, a I think lot he's going to do it again I feel next like year. a lot of people set career highs right. in points. Pretty much... Uh, like. As far as the, all the guys up in like the 90s and the 80 point totals, a lot of those guys hit career highs. Uh, but ultimately, for me, I'm giving this to Sidney Crosby. I don't think without Crosby, the Penguins even sniffed the playoffs. Without Kucherov, I think the Lightning are okay. They're yeah, in the playoffs. Without Hedman, clearly the Lightning are terrible. Piss poor. <laughs> uh, but. Yeah, I think without without Crosby, they missed yeah, the playoffs. Malkin wasn't that great either. I mean, he was good, but yeah, he wasn't. He's he's still Malkin-esque. he's still a very good player. Oh, absolutely. He's still worth what he's what he's paid. He's just not quite that like dominant. Just blow up everything and and ride him for you know a twenty game stretch. Whereas the Penguins rode Sidney Crosby for about fifty games. <laughs> Been riding Sidney Crosby for like fifty years. Well, that too. Uh, so he's my pick. Who's your Ooh, pick for the heart? I would give it to Connor McDavid, honestly. I, I know Kucherov is okay. the easy pick just because it's like, oh, he put up the most points. He put on he was on the number one team in the league that tied the record for most wins, right? So it's easy to say this guy deserves it. But I, I'm kind of in agreement with you where I think without Kucherov on that team, they could have been, you know, they could have had relatively close success and it wouldn't have made that much of an impact. Whereas Connor McDavid, in my opinion, fifty percent of the goals that Edmonton scored this year, Connor McDavid was in on at some point. Which is disgusting. It's madness. And 50%. He, that's yeah, absolutely he madness. kept them pretty dang close to the playoffs all year long. I mean, granted, they were never really truly going to make the playoffs, but he at least made them look like they had a shot for most of the year to get in. Because That and the fact that half the Western Conference didn't feel like winning games. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, tr- I truly think seven of the eight teams that lost in the first round 
you put Connor McDavid on there, they're Stanley Cup favorites. So I, I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. Yes, if you put Connor McDavid on Toronto, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, I don't. But yeah, that's that's a little fantasizing. So to me, I just the the impact he has on his team, the importance he is, I think is. Is the same almost with Sidney Crosby, but to me that that differential when you look at how many goals he was in on for his team just was insane to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a a new award a that new us award. here at Overtime Hockey Talk will be giving out today, and that is to the Overtime Hockey Talk Most Surprising Player of the Year Award. Ooh. Who has just taken your low expectations for this player or maybe just shattered expectations maybe he's somebody that you know you you thought was good and they let you down and then this year they came back with a with a storm and they were they were much better uh who is it in the national hockey league that you pinpoint to uh that you would nominate you can throw out a few we can throw out a few names i was gonna here. say do you want three That's names or? we, we got to get it down to three uh for the most surprising player who who were you not expecting to do what they did this season? First name comes to mind, Mitch Marner. He was on my list. Yes, I would throw Mitch Marner in there because I expected him to be another 60, maybe 70-point player, but to play as well defensively as he did and still put up 90 freaking points. 94 points for Mitch Just Marner. blew me away in terms of where I thought he was going, and his leadership qualities to me just grew exponentially this year. To where I would honestly not be upset if they made him the next captain. So, yeah, I mean, I think Austin Matthews is the next captain, but I, I, I mean, either way, you can be excited for the future, and it's okay. It's Absolutely, just, they just need to get a defenseman, figure that out. Um, I, I want to put Miko Rantanen on the on the list. There, I think we all knew he was really good, and you know, for a minute there, he was blowing everybody away. Uh, he kind of slowed down a little bit, but his stretch in the first half of the season was unbelievable. And uh, I, I think that Miko Rantanen kind of, to me, really came out of nowhere. Uh, maybe not nowhere, but he he went from a place where, again, yeah, he's like he's a guy you you think in the sixty seventy point range. He gets eighty seven points, and he did it in seventy four games too. So he probably would have had if he had played those those other eight games. He's in the ninety point range, and you know we're we're having a, a different discussion. Yes, he gets to play with Nathan McKinnon, but I, I do think that he's now he's kind of playing on his own, and he is driving a line. So okay, he's my one of my surprises. Right. Another another surprise pick for me would be Sebastian Aho. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. He, a team that nobody really expected to make the playoffs. He put that first line on his back and. Just they they looked fun to watch, and you know he's he's another guy. Probably I would have been happy if he had put up sixty, maybe seventy points, but eighty three points to cap the season off, and a very good plus minus number for him. Um, he he really showed himself a, a, a good leader on that team, and and a, has a bright future in Carolina. And it really, if you're a Carolina Hurricanes fan, you got to be excited for this guy to watch him moving forward. So um, to me, it, they're under you know big surprise, big surprise this year. All right, uh, I'm I'm gonna say one of my biggest surprises was Max Domi on the Montreal Canadiens. Max Domi, Thank you. we kind of forget about him a little bit. They missed the playoffs. They almost made it in, but remember that trade Domi for Galchenyuk in the summer. That was kind of a like, all right, these are two teams trading two players who have really struggled and just haven't been able to find their footing. Max Domi comes in. And let's let's be honest here, Montreal Canadiens. I think they've they have actually found a real a real life center. I mean, yeah, he's not the greatest at faceoffs, but I think he can he can sort of play center at least a little better than Galchenyuk. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, he went from you know fifty two points, then thirty eight, then forty five, and it was he only he scored nine two straight seasons with nine goals, and then he comes out has twenty eight goals. 44 assists for 72 points leads the team. And uh, I I don't think that Montreal's necessarily trying to build around this guy, but as a number one center or a number one, even maybe even a top line guy, but looking at him and going, okay, he can absolutely do some damage. He's a great piece to have in your top six. And, uh, and he's somebody who impressed me all year long. All right, all right. 
Uh, lastly, for me, for my to round up my top three, this is the guy who, um, boy, I'm, I might get some flack for to, to nominate this guy, but I'm going to say Jack Campbell, goaltender for the LA Kings. Mm. And I say that because this is a guy who drafted in the first round from Dallas. He he was not expected to be anything more than a journeyman backup, maybe a starter in the AHL. And last year came in, looked pretty good in a few games for L.A. Um, but this year, Quick got hurt. He took over the reins, and he looked freaking good. And if you're an L.A. Kings fan, you can say, okay, we, we can move Jonathan Quick now if we want to, get a good return. And we got a goaltender we don't really have to worry about now. I mean, he played on a horrible, just an absolutely a horrible, horrible team. L.A. team, and he managed to still put up a 928 and a 2.3 goals against with that team. So, Yeah, I don't know if they're trading Jonathan Quick anytime soon, but it is interesting. We'll see. It is interesting to see that. Yeah, that's that's a that's a definitely a different pick. Definitely yeah. a different pick. <laughs> um, one more name for you, Elias Lindholm. Lindholm. Nobody okay, thought like that. that he would do what he did, Elias Lindholm. Ends up with uh, 78 points, and yes, he gets to play with two other really good players, but other people played with Goudreau, with the Gaudreau and Monaghan, and they did not do what Lindholm did. Right, <laughs> Lindholm was good in and of himself, and uh, what a what a steal to scoop him off of yeah, Carolina. Uh, although they gave up Dougie Hamilton, and and I mean it actually Hamilton was good too. I, so. I guess we'll say yeah. this: we'll say that the trade worked out very well for both teams because Calgary goes finishes tops in the West. Granted, they lose in the first round, but that's you know that's that is what it is. Uh, Carolina goes and they're in the second round of the playoffs, and and I think a large part of that is that you know Lindholm was moved out, and that that forced. Sebastian Ajo to take that number one spot, and he definitely ran with that. He so, did, so yeah. that that worked out. So, uh, okay, out of all those players, who are you? Who's who's one of your three? Mitch Marner. Okay, yeah. All right, all right. Mitch Marner, and uh, for me, I'm saying Patrick Kane. Patrick He's Kane. one of my three, even okay. though I didn't mention him in the <laughs> no, beginning. I'm just saying Patrick Kane because holy crap, did he come out of nowhere? He did. Yeah, on and, a team that wasn't expected to do much this year either. And they, yes, they weren't they, great. And in the in he, I think he he at least kept them somewhat relevant for a little bit longer. But I mean, 110 points, 44 goals for a guy who is supposed to be, you know, he's on the other side of 30, and so he's supposed to be on the downturn. Uh, tell that to him, right? Those little speedy guys, though, they can go a little bit longer now in today's NHL because you're not yeah. worried about getting beat up so much. Yeah, that's true. Uh, one more. Who else is in there? Sebastian Ajo. Okay, Sebastian yeah, Ajo. I think so, we've, so we've got Marner, Ajo, and Kane. So it's like the best little men in the league. <laughs> it is. Uh, and out of those three, who's your vote? I still got to go Mitch Marner. I think Mitch Marner. I think so, too. Yeah. I think he just... I think in every way he surprised. He I, did, for I, me. I think we knew he could be good. I don't think we thought that he... I don't think that you when you have a player like Austin Matthews, granted Marner's a winger, I understand that. But when you have a player like Matthews, you you look at Matthews and go, okay, he's the guy, and then everyone else falls into place. And this is starting to look like a true two-headed monster, and it's not because of Tavares. It's because of Marner, and he's the he's the other head. Yeah, I mean, if you look – okay, I heard at the beginning of the season and somewhat into last season too, like a lot of people say, you know what, Matthews is great, Nylander's great, but Marner might be the best offensively gifted player of that whole bunch – I was like, okay, you know what? That's you can you could make that argument, I guess, but I didn't really believe it that much. And coming into the season, if you told me out of Marner, Tavares, Matthews, Nylander, like Marner would have been the top scorer in Toronto this year, I would I would have said no, probably not. I give him maybe a a fifteen percent chance at that. Oh, granted, Matthews did miss fourteen games. Sure. So and and Matthews scored, could he have made up twenty points in Matthews 15 games, scored maybe. eleven goals more than Marner too. So that that I think has something to be said about it. The like goals are definitely the hardest part about this game. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, there is, you know, I still think that Matthews is ultimately the more valuable player. Does Marner have some skills that Matthews doesn't have? Sure. But Matthews, Matthews is Matthews. I mean, I don't think we're, just because we think Mitch Marner's really freaking good doesn't mean anything against Matthews. No, no, you know? not at all. Are you kidding me? Frick, it's like when people talk how good Sidney Crosby is, right? And like, you know, we forget how good Malkin actually right. is too. So right, right. Yeah. Uh, one one other name that you could toss in here. I'll 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 throw you a bone. I'll okay. say Dylan Larkin definitely. Ooh, uh, thank you. I think that 
I still think that on a championship team, he is a second line center. Uh, but I, th- I think at the beginning of this year, I thought that on a championship team, he'd be a third line center. Wow. And I, I think he, this year he really had uh, the kind of year where you look at a guy and you like, he knew that his team wasn't going to be good. No, like, you well, know, of I course, mean, Zetterberg, quote unquote, retires or goes on a long term IR, and so now he doesn't have to worry about splitting time with him on the top. It's more, and it's like this is your team now, kid. He took Go advantage run with of it. it. Yeah, and and he, I think he really was one of those. Like, you looked at him and you were like, "This is the guy that we all thought you could beat." And and he wasn't lassie. He wasn't the year before. He kind of struggled. That forty point sophomore yeah. slump. Yeah. And yeah. and so I'm I'm happy for him because I think that. Whoever comes in with the what the sixth overall pick and Zadina is going to be there full time next year. Please be there full. I think this. Year. I think this is his his team, and it'll be it'll be interesting to and see. And a what bargain, they're. six million a year too. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, that is our show. Continue watching the second round if you uh, want to hit us up on Twitter at OT Hockey Talk. Please subscribe to our podcast and you know maybe share with a friend or two and uh, and let people know that we exist. We love you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great week. Oh, I'm getting married on Saturday. Oh, yeah. Did we forget to mention that to people? I I did. But I'm getting married on Saturday, so we might have a small hiatus (laughs) of episodes. But we'll we'll, we'll see if we can't get one more episode in, and and, uh, then we'll even do some solo episodes. (laughs) All right, guys. We'll talk to you.